Thank you, Dr. Mbales, for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues. So my uh, task this morning will be to uh, talk about acute pancreatitis. We will learn how imaging should be scheduled for patients with acute pancreatitis. And we will also, uh, I will try to uh, make you more familiar with the new terminology that has been proposed in the revised Atlanta classification. So the first part of my speech will be mainly dedicated to those new terminology and new definitions, but uh, first the background. Uh, as you may know, the original Atlanta classification from 92 is clearly outdated. Um, there, are, there were confusing definitions and a, a lack of intervals of agreement when using terms for fluid collection in the pancreatic and peripancreatic areas. So during the period 2007 and 2012, an international web-based consultation um, took place and uh, proposed new concepts and definitions for acute pancreatitis. So grossly, you just have to know that acute pancreatitis is um, differentiated in two clinical phases, an early phase mainly in the first week and a late phase after the first week. Because acute pancreatitis is a dynamic and evolving process, you will find that there are two mortality peaks. The biggest one in the early phase, of course, due to organ failure, and we will uh, uh, stress that point, and a second mortality peak due to local complications. First definition, diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. You need two of the following three features to accurately define it an acute pancreatitis. First, an abdominal pain, which is an acute onset, severe, and persistent epigastric pain. Second feature, uh, an increase of serum lipase activity three times above the upper limit of the normal. And third feature is, of course, characteristic findings on contrast and NCT mainly, but also the consensus paper uh, authorize MRI, of course, and ultrasound to uh, uh, evaluate characteristic findings of acute pancreatitis on imaging studies. If abdominal pain and serum lipase increase activity are present, CT is clearly not required for diagnosis in the ER or on admission at the hospital. And if the acute pancreatitis is not a severe one, CT will not be required at all, at least in theory. Definition of onset of acute pancreatitis. It is clearly the time of onset of abdominal pain and not the time of admission to the hospital. And it's one of the main concerns regarding the onset of acute pancreatitis and to clearly choose the time to schedule CT examination, you have to note or to ask to the patient or to the clinician the time interval between onset of abdominal pain and time of admission to the hospital, which could be quite different, of course. The former classification of Atlanta 92 uh, differentiates three type of pancreatitis, interstitial pancreatitis and necrotizing pancreatitis, either sterile or infected. The new classification of Atlanta 2012, you have only two types of pancreatitis. Interstitial edematous pancreatitis and necrotizing pancreatitis, which is more clear. Both types may be either sterile or infected. Of course, Infection of interstitial edematous pancreatitis is quite a rare situation. So interstitial edematous pancreatitis will um, be seen with inflammatory edema that will cause diffuse or focal enlargement of the pancreatic gland, the so-called uh, type B of the Balthazar classification at CT, and it's in most cases, it will resolve in the first week. On the other hand, necrotizing pancreatitis, which is much more or less common, will um, 
cause impairment of pancreatic perfusion and that uh, uh, lack of pancreatic perfusion will cause necrosis. And that necrosis can be located in the pancreatic parenchyma, in the peripancreatic tissue, or in many cases in both. And we will emphasize that important point because there are many confusion about location of necrosis and the term that could be uh, uh, chosen for that. That necrotizing pancreatitis will evolve for several days and that means that an early contrast in uh, CT may clearly underestimate the extent of the disease and for that reason early CT is not warranted in necrotizing pancreatitis. What about infected pancreatitis? Of course, both pancreatic and peripancreatic necrosis may remain sterile or become infected, but there is no absolute correlation between the extent of necrosis and the risk of infection. And once again, in the first week, infected necrosis is a rare condition. So let's go back to the two phases. Those phases are overlapping, of course, but the early phase is more or less uh, during the first week of disease. During that first week of disease, the host response to the pancreatic injury, the so-called systematic inflammatory response syndrome, will be uh, the main cause for severity, and it will, it will be, the severity at that time will be related to the presence and duration of organ failure. And we will definite organ failure in the next slide. At that time, the early phase, we do not encounter any local complications usually. And those local complications are not predominant determinant for severity. And once again, extent of the morphologic changes are not proportional to the severity of organ failure. So there is clearly no need to evaluate the morphological changes in the first week of disease. So, Looking uh, very accurately to the reference paper uh, published in GARP 2013, which is the uh, uh, reference paper from the International Working Group, there is no clear recommendation for scheduling CT, but you will find 72 hours at least. So I know that in real life we will discuss that point. It's clearly difficult, but no CT before 72 hours. And some authors advocate for more than that after the first week. So what is organ failure? Organ failure uh, needs uh, assessment of respiratory, renal for, with serum creatinine, and cardiovascular with systolic blood pressure uh, evaluation. A score of two or more uh, in any of these three systems will define the presence of organ failure. You can have single organ failure or multiple organ failure. And what will be important is to have transient or persistent organ failure. Let's move to the late phase. The late phase uh, grossly begins after the first week. And at that time, the severity will be related to either Persistent organ failure over 48 hours and presence of local complications. And local complications that will be defined in the next slides will clearly be a need for morphological evaluation and clearly for contrast and NCT. So there is at that late phase a need clearly for both clinical and morphological criteria. Let's define local complications. Local complications are more or less presence of pancreatic and peripancreatic collections. And we have now specific terminology for those morphologic features that will be detailed in the next slides. And other complications, of course, are possible, including portal thrombosis, colonic necrosis, or a, a pancreatic pseudoaneurysm, but we will not detail them uh, for uh, time constraints. Those local complications should be suspected in case of recurrence of abdominal pain if you have a secondary increase in serum amylase level and also if you have increased organ dysfunction or increase in CRP, fever, or leukocytosis 
that are related to a sepsis condition. There are three types of uh, acute pancreatitis in terms of severity. Mild acute pancreatitis is a less severe one. In that case, you will have no organ failure at all and no local or systemic complications. This is by far the much, the much more frequent type, and in such a situation, the mortality is very, very close from zero. The second severity grade is moderately severe acute pancreatitis. Moderately severe acute pancreatitis is defined by presence of transient organ failure that resolve less, sorry for that mistake, less than 48 hours, and or local or systemic complications without persistent organ failure. Systemic complication meaning exacerbation of comorbidities patient with a, a heart failure or a chronic lung disease, for example. And the third grade of severity, the most important one, severe acute pancreatitis, is uh, defined by persistent organ failure uh, after 40, more than 48 hours. That could be single or multiple, and in that case, mortality may be up to 50%. We have two types of collections in acute pancreatitis. Collection composed of fluid alone and collection composed partly with solid components and mainly with fluid and solid components. So know the terminology. If the collections are composed with fluid alone and if you are in the first four weeks, you should call that collection acute peripancreatic fluid collection, APFC. So remember that term, it's a new term, APFC for uh, acute peripancreatic fluid collection in the first four weeks with fluid alone. And of course, it's related to the type of interstitial edematous pancreatitis. After four weeks in interstitial edematous pancreatitis, those fluid collection may become a pancreatic pseudocyst. Regarding collection with solid components, in the first four weeks, they should be called acute necrotic collection, A and C. And after four weeks, those necrotic collections have a, a new term, which is Waldorf necrosis, one. Let's detail the CT appearance and the imaging appearance of those four types of collections. First, APFC. APFC are supposed to be adjacent to the pancreas, to be uh, seen with fluid density and with homogeneous content, and they are confined by normal fascial planes, in particular by the, uh, the para-renal anterior fascia. They have no well-defined wall, which is important, and they are extra-pancreatic only. If you see lack of enhancement, inside the pancreatic parenchyma. Of course, it's not APFC. It will be clearly ANC, acute necrotic collection. So it's in, it's in the fourth four weeks, and it's related to interstitial edematous pancreatitis. Most of the APFC will remain sterile, and most of them will resolve spontaneously. Only a very few of them will evolve to a pancreatic pseudocyst. So if it persists after four weeks, it will give a pseudocyst, but clearly it's a rare situation. This is an example of a interstitial edematous pancreatitis in a 52-year-old female. Here you have uh, something which clearly looks like APFC. It's uh, uh, strictly around the pancreas. It's homogeneous. It's a fluid density. Uh, it's confined to the normal planes. And the same patient two weeks later, evolves to normal CT appearance. What about pancreatic pseudocysts? They are defined as a fluid collection in the peripancreatic tissues with well-circumscribed appearance. They are round or oval-shaped with a homogeneous low attenuation, and they have a well-defined enhancing wall. 
there is no solid component. Of course, CT is not the best examination to, uh, uh, to be sure that there is no solid component. And of course, MRI or US are by far much more accurate in uh, uh, detecting solid component in a fluid-like collection at CT. So pancreatic cytocysts should be, uh, that term should be uh, uh, used only after four weeks of uh, evolution. It looks like a pancreatic pseudocyst here at CT. It's a round shape. You have an enzyme wall. It looks homogeneous, but in the, in the same patient, you, you can see here in the pancreatic body or around the pancreatic body something which is much more heterogeneous. Okay, in, in such a situation, of course, I think MRI is clearly a, a, a solving problem a technique because, of course, it's not a, 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 a pseudocyst. It's a necrotic collection with solid components, which is clearly seen here. And here it looks also like a pseudocyst, but here also there are some solid components inside the lesion. So it's a cute necrotic collection. Some pseudocysts may uh, appear uh, in a very uh, bizarre situation, including the mediastinum, as you know. And um, we also have to know that in pancreatic pseudocysts, the fluid inside the cyst uh, will have increased amylase activity. That means uh, for, uh, that increased amylase activity is related to a, a disruption of the pancreatic duct with communication between the cyst and the pancreatic ducts. It may clearly be important to uh, assess that uh, condition and to make a diagnosis of duct rupture because it could influence patient's management. Contrast and NCT, of course, may be able to detect such a pancreatic disruption, but I have to uh, admit that uh, I took that picture from a, a CT that I performed more than 10 years ago to be able to, to, to show you such a nice picture. Of course, CT in case of non-dilated duct is not the best technique to uh, make the diagnosis of rupture. MR by far is much, much more accurate. So if you have to assess the ducts in acute pancreatitis, and you should assess the duct, even though the, the new Atlanta classification does not ask it in a regular situation for every patient, you should use MR. And that's that nice example from the, the paper of Celso in radiographics 10 years ago, perfectly uh, show that disruption and communication between the main pancreatic duct using secretin um, with that pseudocyst that is clearly shown here on the uh, haste sequence. So, of course, MRCP for assessment of the duct and uh, disruption. What about acute necrotic collection? This is a term you should use in the first four weeks in case of uh, pancreatic necrosis and it's located in the pancreatic parenchyma and or the peripancreatic tissues. It will contain both fluid and solid material, and it will look clearly heterogeneous with variably lobulated uh, peripheral appearance, but it's not encapsulated in the uh, early four weeks. It may be sterile or becomes infected, and... To be, uh, to be clear in the first week, and uh, mainly if you do uh, an early CT before 72 hours, it will be clearly difficult to distinguish between APFC and ANC. First example here, you have something who looks like APFC. It's, in my opinion, quite homogeneous, low density, um, around the pancreas, it could be acute pancreatic fluid collection, but it could be also acute necrotic collection. So you have to wait for the next CT. It's day three, and here it's day eight. At day eight, no doubt, it is not APFC. It's an acute necrotic collection. It's a necrotizing pancreatitis. And day 20, it's an infected necrotizing pancreatitis due to the presence of gas here. So acute necrotic collation could be in both pancreatic and peripancreatic necrosis. This is the most common situation, accounting for around 75 to 80% of the cases, according to the paper from Tony. So both pancreatic, as you can see here, and peripancreatic, as you can see here, necrosis. 
Another example with both intrapancreatic and extrapancreatic uh, low uh, dense formation uh, corresponding to acute necrotic collections. Second situation, which is very, very rare, the pancreatic necrosis is only in pancreatic parenchyma alone, with a lack of parenchyma uh, enhancement. And this is a case at day five I took from the paper from Tony, with only intrapancreatic necrosis without peripancreatic necrosis, which once again is very rare. Another example, the personal example here in the pancreatic head, which is not a tumor, but uh, clearly a, 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 a lack of enhancements related to pancreatic necrosis. And a third situation, which is very important to uh, emphasize because sometimes it creates still confusion. You could, you could have acute necrotic collection in necrotizing pancreatitis with only peripancreatic necrosis. It's not so rare, it accounts for around 20% of the situation, and it has a better prognosis compared to a necrosis present in both pancreatic parenchyma and peripancreatic area. And here it is an example where there is normal enhancement of the pancreas, but a large amount of fluid, but I will detail that example in a few slides. The fourth and last terms, world of necrosis. The previously sequestration, necroma, or organized Pancreatic necrosis, never use that term again. It's world of necrosis, one. So it's only after four weeks, it's uh, inside the pancreatic parenchyma and or outside of the pan pancreatic parenchyma. It will contain necrotic material, so liquefied and non-liquefied solid components. It will appear heterogeneous, mainly with uh, fat-containing areas, and it will be uh, variably lobulated, but the main point is it is very well encapsulated with an enhancing pseudo wall. Uh, and this is the main difference with acute necrotic collection. So it, it can sterile or become uh, infected, of course, and wall of necrosis, because it will contain necrotic material, will have that diagnosis will have influence of the management of the patients because he will. Many, in many cases, when it's a huge in volume like that, it will need drainage, even though it is not infected. So back to the case where there is only peripancreatic necrosis. As you can see here, the pancreatic parenchyma is clearly seen everywhere, and there is no defect of enhancement. There is no intrapancreatic necrosis. But around the pancreas, clearly, it's not APFC. It's acute necrotic collection, and after four weeks, clearly, it becomes walled off necrosis. So it's peripancreatic necrosis alone. And after 12 weeks, that patient uh, recovers uh, after five months of hospitalization with a successful drainage. What about the complications of acute pancreatitis? Of course, infection may concern all collections, and presence of gas is the main CT findings indicating infection. Of course, fine needle aspiration or drainage also may give you the uh, diagnosis of infected pancreatitis. So infection may concern all types of collections, and in that case here, you can see intrapancreatic collections, A and C, uh, with clearly gas in, the, in this collection in the head of the pancreas, and also small bubble of gas here. This is clearly infected uh, acute necrotic collections. Portal thrombosis, of course, is a common situation in acute pancreatitis. It's not only for splenic and superior mesentic veins, but also it can be seen in intrahepatic portal veins, like here. For the last two minutes, I would like to uh, uh, emphasize the remaining questions. First, is clearly CT the best technique for assessment of peripancreatic collections? In my opinion, clearly not. The place for MRI assessment has not been wide, uh, widely discussed in the uh, 2012 Atlanta classification, and in particular, assessment of the ducts should appear in a, in a new severity score. It's not the case today, but clearly it will be discussed for the next years. Maybe second question, which is a, a daily 
uh, questions quite difficult. Are we really able to follow the rules in particular? Are we able to wait until 72 hours before performing the first CT? I perfectly know that uh, in the year, uh, most physicians will say, okay, it's, it's probably acute pancreatitis, but are you sure that it will be not ischemic condition uh, or mesenteric ischemia or something that needs urgent CT? So I know that in, in my own department, that rule is not respected every time. So uh, I don't have the, the good way to resolve that problem, but I put the question on the table. Maybe we can discuss that point. So to conclude, the reverse classification of acute pancreatitis has identified two phases of the disease, an early during the first week and a late phase after the first week. There are three grades of severity. Mild acute pancreatitis is the most common form, has no organ failure, local or systemic complication, and usually will resolve in the first week. The second way, moderately severe acute pancreatitis, is defined by the presence of transient organ failure, local complications, or exacerbation of comorbid disease. And severe acute pancreatitis is defined by persistent organ failure more than 48 hours, and finally, for local complication, remember to use only those four terms, APFC, peripancreatic fluid collections for uh, the, f the, the first four weeks in case of interstitial edematous pancreatitis, acute necrotic collection in the first four weeks of uh, uh, pancreatic uh, necrotizing pancreatitis, pseudocyst in case of interstitial automatous pancreatitis after four weeks and Waldorf necrosis uh, after four weeks in case of necrotizing pancreatitis. All those collections may be sterile or become infected. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>